Hello, good evening. Happy Tuesday. So welcome. We're going to get in AF. Woo! Welcome. Awesome. We're going to get back into this amazing read. It's called The Music Lesson. A Spiritual Search for Growth Through Music by Victor L. Wooten. And we're getting into chapter one, which is actually in this cool book. They're all, uh, all the chapters are measures. So this is the first measure, groove. You should never lose the groove in order to find a note. I'd been working in the Nashville music scene for many years and not once had I seen him. I was a known player around town and had played in many bands and no one had ever mentioned his name. Although I hoped to make a decent living playing music, keeping my head above water on a consistent level was always a struggle and the present struggle was rapidly getting the best of me. Maybe that's what brought him out. I was out of work, but determined not to take a job waiting tables like so many musicians in town were forced to do. My landlord had just called to remind me that the end of the month was only a few days away, and with no gigs lined up, I was in no rush to return his call. My girlfriend, well, no need to lie about that. I didn't have one. As much as I tried, I could never seem to break into the recording session scene. The few sessions I'd done never generated any return calls. Excuse me. And whenever I lost a gig with a club band, I rarely knew why. I was a good bass player. Not the best, but good. So I couldn't understand why anyone wouldn't want me in his band. Without a steady gig and not knowing what to do, I decided to start practicing more. I didn't like practicing and still don't. But I knew that I had to change something. It was either magically get better, alter my playing style, or move to another town and start all over. Realizing the gravity of my situation, I decided to practice. Did I mention that I hate practicing? I never know what to practice or why I'm practicing it. I also get sleepy in the middle of the process. I gotta cough one sec here. So there I was at home, painstaking, painstakingly working on scales and modes and not knowing why. I just knew that my previous teachers had told me to do so. All the books I'd ever read said the same thing. So that's what I was doing. I was at my lowest point emotionally because I wasn't getting anywhere with my playing and I wasn't satisfied with my current playing situation. My home life and my love life, well, my whole life in general, wasn't in the best of shape. The rain beating down on the metal siding of my duplex, coupled with the monotony of playing scales, was lulling me to sleep. It was during one of my sleeping sessions, I mean practice sessions, that I first met him, or more accurately, when he first showed up. And that is exactly what he did. He showed up, uninvited. At least, I thought he was uninvited. He had a different story. He said that I'd actually called him. I'm still confused by that statement, but somehow, for some reason, there he was in my house. <laughs> I have no idea how long the stranger had been standing there looking down on me. The fact that he was completely dry when it was raining outside made me wonder if he'd been there a while. If he'd been there a while. The strangest part of all that... Wait, wait. The strangest part of all is that I didn't want him to leave. From my position on the couch, he appeared quite tall and mysterious. He was wearing a blue NASA-style jumpsuit and a black motorcycle helmet. And even though his eyes were hidden, I could feel them penetrating deep into my mind, as though he was looking for the proper place to begin. How'd you get in here, I asked, startled, half asleep, and wondering why I wasn't angry at his intrusion. You asked me to come. I did? Yes. But how'd you get in here? Who let you in? You did. Oh, really? Did I give you a key? I don't need a key. Who are you? I'm your teacher. Wow. Hey, good to see you, PPR. Welcome in. Welcome all. My teacher? Yes. My teacher of what? Nothing. Nothing? Well, then, what are you supposed to teach me? What do you want to learn? Lots of things. What can you teach me? Nothing. What do you mean, nothing? Exactly that nothing. 
This was typical of conversations to come, but at that time, I didn't know what to make of him, and I needed a straightforward answer. You have to do better than that. You showed up in my house unannounced. I think I deserve some kind of explanation. Tilting his head, he looked at me through the face shield of his helmet and replied, I teach nothing because there is nothing to be taught. You already know everything you need to know, but you asked me to come, so here I am. But you said that you're my teacher. Yes, I did, but try to understand. Teacher is just a title. I cannot teach you because no one can teach another person anything. What do you mean by that? You can only teach yourself until we live in a day where I can physically implant knowledge into your head. I can teach you nothing. I can only show you things. What can you show me? Anything. Show me everything then, I replied. That would take a while. It might be easier if we pick a subject. Okay, how about music? Perfect, music. Shall we begin? I didn't know if I was ready to begin anything with this character. I already told you he was wearing a blue jumpsuit and a black motorcycle helmet. Yes, he was still wearing the helmet. But did I mention that he was carrying a skateboard under his left arm and a burlap, ba a burlap bag over his shoulder? I imagined him riding his skateboard down the street, through the rain, in this getup. <laughs> I didn't know what I was getting myself into. I also couldn't tell if he was really serious or not. For all I knew, he could have been there to rob me, but I don't think so. There was a lot I didn't know, but I decided to play along anyway. There was an intriguing quality about him, and I wanted to know more. Wait a minute. If you're not a teacher, what are you? What should I call you? Michael. Call me Michael, he answered as he removed his helmet and offered me his hand. Archangel Michael? I remember his bright blue eyes as hypnotic. They had an immediate effect on me. Somehow, I sensed they could see beneath the surface, and I was fearful of what he might uncover. I struggled to stay in control. Not bothering to move from my reclined position on the couch, I allowed his hand to dangle in the air. Asserting what I thought was dominance... I responded in a cocky tone. Okay, Michael, what can you teach me about music? Nothing. I already told you that, he answered, retracting his hand. I tried teaching many times before, once as an Apache medicine man in New Jersey and twice as a yogi in India. I even tried teaching while flying biplanes in Illinois. What? <laughs> oh my gosh, seriously. If you want to listen to me read Illusions, The Adventures of a, of, a of a Reluctant Messiah by Richard Bach, you can find it in my playlists, which that is what that references. This time around, I am living the laws of music. Some may call me a teacher, but... I don't teach, I show. This guy was full of, well, something. I couldn't quite make him out. Is this a joke, I thought? Is he an actor? He said that he is living the laws of music. What does that mean? Music has rules that I know, but laws? It's not like we're talking about the law of gravity or the speed of light or science, he commented, interrupting my thoughts. Music is bigger than you think. Science, I said to myself. That's exactly what I was going to say. How did he do that? Coincidence? Must have, must have been. Mu, mu, he continued, is an ancient word for mother, and sick is just an abbreviation for the word science. So, put together, music means the mother of all sciences. Boom! <clears throat> So you see, music is important. I can show you this science. I can show this science to you if you'd like. It is something. Oh, wait. Is it something you would like to see? Even though he was talking like a crazy man, he had my undivided attention. But I didn't want to give in too soon. I also figured that since it was my house, I should be the one asking the questions. 
I reclined even more and laced my fingers behind my head. Next, I put my legs in a crossed position and tried to act cool. He gave a slight smile as if he was ready to counter my every move. What instrument do you play? I asked. He turned and took a seat in the chair across from me. Laying his skateboard in his lap, he tucked his hair behind his right ear and took a breath before responding. I play music, not instruments. What do you mean by that? I asked, losing my imagined control of the conversation. <laughs> I'm a musician, he answered. He placed his hand on his chest to emphasize his point before gesturing at me. You are just a bass player. That means you play the bass guitar. A true musician like me plays music and uses particular instruments as tools to do so. I know that music is inside me and not inside the instrument. This understanding allows me to use any instrument or no instrument at all to play my music. I am a true musician and one day you too shall be. He spoke with confidence and I was trying to find a way to strip him of it. Are you saying that you can play any instrument? I asked. Of course I can, and so can you. It is this knowing that separates us. A true writer can write using a typewriter, a pen, a pencil, or anything else that he chooses. You wouldn't call him a pencil writer, would you? Your understanding, your understanding that the writing utensil is just a tool allows you to see past, see past it and into the truth of what he is, a writer. The story is in the writer, is it not? Or is it in the pencil? Your problem is this. You have been trying to tell your story with a bass guitar instead of through it. I liked what he was saying, and that bothered me. Trying to hold on to my resistance, I struggled to find the holes in his argument. The more I lay there thinking about what he'd said, the more interested I became in Michael and his ideas, and the less in and the less interested I became in finding the holes. He definitely had an, a unique way of looking at things. Yes, he had shown up uninvited, and I probably should have been upset about that. At first I was, but suddenly I wanted more. I wanted to hear him talk. If he could help me become a better bass player, I was ready to let him, maybe. Do you know what it means to be a bass guitarist, he asked. The question was a strange one. I didn't know how to answer, so I didn't. The bass guitar is the honorable instrument, he declared. What do you mean? I asked. It is understated and underappreciated, yet it plays the most important role. The bass is the link between harmony and rhythm. It is the foundation of a band. It is what all the other instruments stand upon, but it is rarely recognized as that. I struggled between getting sucked in by his words and trying to keep my dominance over the situation. He was winning. The foundation of any building has to be the strongest part, he continued. But you will never hear anyone walk into a building and say, my, what a nice foundation. Unless the foundation is weak, it will go unnoticed. People will walk all over it and never acknowledge that it is there. The life of a true bass guitarist is the same. Wow, that's pretty cool. I never thought of it that way before. Why not, he asked. I was disappointed in my outburst. I didn't want to show my enthusiasm just yet, so I reg regained my composure and answered more calmly. I don't know. I guess no one ever taught me music this way before. Therein lies your first problem, he stated. Problem? What do you mean by that? You still think that you can be taught. Not knowing what to stay, to say, I stared at the floor in silence for a long while. The stranger remained quiet as well, allowing me time to digest his words. I wasn't sure what he was talking about. I mean, we're all taught at some point in our lives, aren't we? I can remember taking music lessons as a kid, and I definitely had a teacher. I'd even taught music lessons myself when I first moved to town. Realizing again that I'd totally lost control of our dialogue, I found myself getting worked up. I was reclined on the couch with my bass in my lap, trying to figure out something to say. He was sitting there in front of me, in what I would eventually think of as his chair. I could tell he was looking directly at me, but I dared not look back. For some reason, 
I didn't want him to know how uncomfortable I was. Remember, it had just been a few minutes since I was uh, practicing. My mind was in a daze. My thoughts were racing. And there was a stranger in my house. I reflected on grade school and all my teachers and all the summer music camps I'd attended when I used to play cello. How about all the music books or even the metaphysical books I'd read over the years? They were interesting, but none of them had prepared me for this. Neither my mom nor my dad played a musical instrument, but they were very musical, more musical than some musicians I know. They sang in church, and there was always a record playing on their stereo at home. They also helped spark my interest by taking me to concerts when I was young and supported my musical interests by offering to pay for lessons if I wanted them. I can't say they taught me how to play music, but they surely supported my decision to play. Hearing it around the house was such a major part of my childhood that it was like a second language to me. Language, that's good, Michael spoke out of the blue as if reading my thoughts. Pearl, welcome, this is so good. What? I replied in disbelief. Language, that's a good one. Wait a minute, can you read music? He interrupted with a sly smile. Of course I can, can't you? That's not what I was going to say, I muttered. Knowing where I was headed, or knowing where I was heading, he steered the conversation by asking, is music a language? I would say so. Then why don't you treat it like one? <clears throat> what do you mean? What language do you speak the best? He asked. English, I answered. Are you better at English than you are at music? Much, I answered, not knowing where he was headed. At what age did you get really good at English? I would say by about age four or five, I was fluent. And at what age did you get really good at music? I'm still working on it, I answered in total seriousness. So it took you only four or five years to get really good at English. But even though you've been speaking music for almost four times as long, you're still not really good at it yet? Well, I guess not. I answered, finally realizing his point. I hadn't looked at it from that perspective. Why not? Michael asks. I don't know why. Maybe I just haven't practiced enough. I was frustrated by the question. How much did you practice English? All the time, I answered, but then I thought about it. Well, I didn't really practice English. I just spoke it a lot. Bingo, he replied. That is why you speak the language naturally. So are you saying that I should stop practicing music? I asked sarcastically, trying to regain some ground. I'm not saying that you should or shouldn't do anything. I'm just comparing the two languages and your process of learning them. If music and English are both languages, then why not apply the process used to get good at one of them to the other? Realizing I totally lost my ability to direct the conversation, I finally relaxed and gave in. How did I, how did I do that? I asked. How do you do that, was his reply. I had to think for a minute, but I soon came up with an answer. Well, when I was young, I was surrounded by people who spoke English. I was probably hearing it even before I was born. So since I've heard people speaking English every day of my life, it was easy for me to pick up because it was always around. How's that? It's a start. Keep going, he said. Okay. Because I heard English every day, speaking it came naturally to me. I was talking more quickly and with more confidence. It wasn't something I ever thought about. It wasn't something I ever really practiced. I just did it. I just listened to it and spoke it. And the more I spoke it, the better I got. That's brilliant. See, you do understand. I like the part about it coming naturally to you. I must be a good teacher, he said, smiling. <laughs> hey, Kimba, welcome in. <clears throat> Comedian? Yes. Teacher? I'm not so sure, I retorted, joining in, joining in on the fun. How can we apply this approach to music? Michael inquired. I'm not so sure, I answered. I'm around music most of the time. It's hard to go anywhere without hearing some type of music playing in the background. So that part of it is similar to English, but I know that there's still something missing. There has to be something else that keeps me from being just as good at music as I am at English. 
I thought for a moment. Oh, I know. I speak English every day. I'm always talking, but I'm not always playing. I don't play music every day. If I played my bass every day, I'd be just as good. Is that it? Did you speak English every day when you were a baby? He asked. Well, not exactly. Apparently there was more. Do you need to speak English every day to get better at it? He asked. No, I don't. Then what's missing? I don't know. My frustration grew. Just tell me. Jamming, he stated with a slight nod of his head. What? Jamming, he repeated. It's the missing element. When you were a baby, you were allowed to jam with the English language. From day one, not only were you allowed to jam, you were encouraged to. And better yet, you didn't just jam. You jammed with professionals. Just about everyone you communicated with when you were a baby was already a master of the English language. And because of that, you are now a master. A master? I inquired. A genuine master, he confirmed. The only reason you are not called a master is that everyone else is just as good, as it, good at it as you are. Everyone is a master. Think about it. If you were as good at music as you are at English, you would surely be considered a master, would you not? Oh my God, you're right. Another unintended outburst. The words just leapt from my mouth, seemingly of their own free will. What he was trying, what he was saying made so much sense. I was surprised I'd never recognized it before. Thanks for the compliment, but please keep listening, the stranger continued. There are only two elements that allowed you to become a master of the English language at such a young age. Only two. Being surrounded by it and jamming with it. That's it. English came quickly and easily to you. And from what you told me, you were also surrounded by music. So it must be jamming that makes the difference. Hmm. You know, Corey and I started to get really good at music together when we were jamming together every day. Just because we loved music. And there's this like magnetic pull to do it. Oh. <clears throat> Woo! Ooh, today I'm drinking, I got some um, African redbush tea in. It's rooibos. It's very good. Oh, I got a hair stuck in my necklace. It's pulling. Okay, there we go. My cat must have been petting herself on this thing. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, okay. So it must be jamming that makes the difference. Imagine if we allowed beginners to jam with professionals on a daily basis. Do you think it would take them 20 years to get good? Absolutely not. It wouldn't even take them 10. They would be great by the time they were musically four or five years old. Instead, we keep the beginners in the beginning level class for a few years before we let them move up to the intermediate level class. After a few more years at that level, they may move up to the advanced level class, but they still have to work up through the ranks of that class before they are really considered advanced level players. Once they stay at that level for a few years, we turn them loose so that they can go pay their dues elsewhere. Think about it. After all these years of training, you still have to pay dues. When it comes to learning a language, what does paying dues mean? How many dues did you have to pay while learning English? Michael had interesting things to say. Abandoning my need for dominance, I sat up on the couch. The only way I can explain it is that I wanted to get closer to what he was saying. I wanted him to keep talking all day if he was willing, but he paused as if inviting me to say something. I see your point, I replied, but not all of us has, have access to professional musicians. I can't just call up Herbie Hancock or Mike Stern and say, hey, I'm coming over, want to jam? So what now? What am I supposed to do if I don't have professionals to play with every day? 
You could have been chosen to be born into a family of professional musicians, he answered without a smile, making it hard for me to tell if he was serious or not. <laughs> it's too late for that now, I replied. I guess so. There is always next time. Still, there are professionals you can bring here to you. Really? Now? Now? How am I supposed to do that? I wasn't following his logic. Who would you like to jam with? He asked. Well, I've always wanted to play with Miles Davis, I answered with a smile. I was only half joking. Placing his skateboard on the floor, he rode over to my bookshelf and pulled out a Miles Davis CD, as if he placed it there himself. I didn't think, a much, I didn't think much about it then. He put the CD in the player, pressed play, and nodded his head toward me. What do you want to, what do you want me to do? I asked. Play, he answered. What am I supposed to play? What is Miles asking you? What do you mean, what is Miles asking me? I thought you said music is a language. Are you telling me that you can't understand what Miles is asking you to play? Um, I don't know. I sighed. I was slightly embarrassed by the question. He turned off the CD player and picked up my acoustic guitar, which was sitting in the corner being used as a coat rack. The guitar was an old beat up pawn shop special that hadn't been played or even tuned for I don't know how long. It didn't even have a brand name. I called it a Majapan guitar because it was made in Japan. Years earlier, I had a pickup installed inside but I rarely plugged it in. That guitar was unplayable, or so I thought. He sat down, placed his foot on top of his skateboard, and without the slightest bit of hes hesitation, began to produce the most amazing sounds. The music that poured out from beneath Michael's fingers was astounding. It was, well, it was Miles Davis. Play, he ordered. What key are you in? I asked as I picked up my bass. Ignoring my question, he looked me straight in the eyes and repeated himself in a stern voice. Play. I recognized the song right away. It was So What from the Kind of Blue album. But I had no clue as to the key he was playing in. I fumbled around for a while until I finally found it. <clears throat> and as soon as I did, Michael stopped playing. Where are you from? I asked abruptly. Virginia, he replied. Oh, wait, no, wait. He, he asked abruptly. He, uh, Where are you from? He asked abruptly. Virginia, I replied. Immediately, he started playing again as if he didn't care about my answer, but this time he was in a different key. Play, he instructed again. What key? I repeated. He stopped playing, this time asking me for my shoe size. Nine and a half, I replied. More than a bit confused. Play, he commanded in a stronger voice as he continued strumming the guitar. I knew better than to ask for the key, so once again, I fumbled around until I found it, and once again, as soon as I did, he stopped. What kind of bass is that? He inquired for some unknown reason. A violin-shaped univox. It's a copy of a... Not letting me complete my sentence, he spoke firmly. Why is it that when I ask you a verbal question, your answer is immediate and direct, but when I ask you this, he started playing again in a different key, you don't seem to know the answer. Don't you know this song? Yes, I do, but... Well, what's stopping you? Play! He ne Play! He nearly shouted. But I need to find the key first. I tried to, to hide my frustration, but he sensed it and didn't seem to care. Oh, I see. You can't play music until you first find the key. Very elementary. He stood up and walked over to where I was sitting. I guess it was so he could talk down to me. What do you need a key for? I didn't even I didn't even need a key to get into your house. Do you think your listeners have time to wait for you to find the key? Well, usually I know the key before I start playing, I responded with hesitation. Do you always know what you're going to say before you start talking? No. And does that stop you from talking? Not usually. Okay then, play. He sat back down again, started playing in yet another key. For the first time, he seemed a little irritated, which didn't make things any easier for me. I took a deep breath and jumped right in, playing along with him as best I could. 
I fumbled around trying to find the root note so I could figure out something good to play, but quickly got frustrated and put the bass down. That was horrible, I mumbled. You could use some help, but we'll get there, he replied in a gentle voice. He was smiling now, as if pleased with me all of the sudden. What were you thinking about when you were playing? I was trying to figure out the right key. And you need to find the right key before you can play music? It helps. Why? I need to find the right key so that I can play the right notes. I see. Notes are so important that all music stops until you find the right ones? I didn't say that. Yes, you did. You said it clearly with your bass. Well, tell me then. When should I find the right notes? You shouldn't. I shouldn't? No, not at first anyway. There is something more important you should find first. And what is that? The groove. The groove? Wait a minute. So the first thing I should do is find the groove when I start playing? That was news to me. No, you should find the groove before you start playing. It doesn't matter whether you know the song or not. If you need to, let a few measures go by while you figure out what the groove is saying. Once you find the groove, it doesn't matter what note comes out. It will feel right to the listener. People generally feel music before they listen to it anyway. If finding the key is so important to you, at least find it while you groove. I wanted to say something, but I couldn't think of a way to prove him wrong. I just stared at him while I fidgeted with my bass. Forget about your instrument, he said, staring back at me. Forget about the key. Forget about technique. Hear and feel the groove. Then allow yourself to become part of the music. Still holding the guitar, he started playing again. He leaned forward and nodded. Realizing I was not going to win the staring contest, I closed my eyes and waited, trying to figure out what to do. I decided to give in and do what he had suggested. Listen. I listened to the groove. <clears throat> Then a strange thing happened. Listening to the groove allowed me to hear more of the music. All of a sudden, along with Michael's guitar part, I could hear the drums, then the piano. I could hear Miles' trumpet, too. I could even hear myself playing the bass, even though I wasn't holding it yet. As if he was listening to what I was hearing, he spoke more softly this time. Play. Hey, no capitals. Hey, Milky Way. Welcome, everyone. Awesome. Without opening my eyes, I picked up my bass and started playing. I don't know if the first note I played was the right one or not, but it surely sounded good, really good. I was shocked. I didn't want to lose the feeling, so I kept playing. I was lost in the music. The thought of a blue-eyed stranger in my house was no longer an issue. I was jamming with Miles Davis. Dude, I love Miles Davis. I opened my eyes to see that Michael had stopped playing and had already put the guitar down. He was applauding me, yelling, Bravo! Bravo! I was proud of myself. How did I do that? I asked. How did you do that? Michael repeated, forcing me to answer my own question once again. I don't quite know, but it sounded good to me. I just grooved, I guess. I didn't think about the notes at all, but everything I played seemed to work. That's right. Everything worked because you grooved before you started playing, he added. Groove before I play. I resolved to commit this new concept to memory. I have a saying, Michael said, and I think you should remember it. It goes like this. Never lose the groove in order to find a note. I like that, and I think I understand it. Are you saying that grooving is more important than playing the right notes? Don't jump to conclusions prematurely. All the elements of music are equally important. Or not. <laughs> the elements of music? What are you talking about? What is that? The elements of music are the individual parts that make up music as a whole. Many musicians like yourself struggle because they're not familiar enough with all the elements. You rely mostly on one or two of them when you play. Doing that is a great recipe for frustration. A musician like me who appropriately uses all the elements, will be one of the greats, even though he may not be aware of the fact that he is using them. Actually, it would be nearly impossible to become a great musician without using all of these elements. <clears throat> what he was saying was interesting, even though I didn't totally understand the concept. Elements was not a term I usually associated with music. 
Can you please tell me more about these elements and how to use them? That was something I had to know more about. He flashed a sly, a sly smile, leaned forward, and whispered, Why do you think I'm here? Ooh! That was measure one. I like having one chapter streams. Oh my. All right, we're gonna do measure two also. Notes. If you stopped playing notes, music would still exist. Let's pretend that music is made up of 10 equal parts, Michael began. If we were to take a few minutes to break music into parts, we would come up with hundreds of different ways of doing it. But, but, but for the sake of argument, let's just say that it contains only 10 different parts, 10 different elements that are all equal or not. Michael, why do you keep saying or not? I asked, because the choice is always yours, he answered. Okay, then, Michael, let's do it or not. I countered with my own smile. His eyes widened and he gave me a thumbs up before continuing the lesson. Even though you didn't know the key, what you just played sounded good because you had most of the elements in balance. If you do that consistently, it won't matter if you make a mistake. It will fly right past the listener's ears because the music will still feel, feel right. He raised an eyebrow. Do you understand? Yes, I think so, but can you tell me what each of the elements is? I would rather you tell me. I'll give you the first one just to get you started, but you must give me the rest. You're already very familiar with the first one because it gets most of your attention when you play. We'll call the first of the elements notes. Yeah, now I realize that notes are the first thing I think about. What about the other elements, I asked. What about them, Michael continued. If notes are just one of the ten elements, what would the other nine be? <clears throat> How about melody or harmony, I asked. Wouldn't those be included in the first category? Anything dealing with pitches will put into the notes category. That means harmony, melody, reharmonization, scales, modes, chords, key signatures, relative majors and minors, and other stuff like that. What else besides notes can you come up with? How about articulation? Good one. That's number two. What else? Technique. Nice. Go on. How about feel? I like that one because it can be looked at in different ways. Most people about most people think about feel as it relates to the groove, but that's just the obvious way to look at it. I can show you other ways of looking at feel. If you approach it from the angle of emotion, meaning how you feel when you play or how the listener feels, and how you can affect that, then it gets interesting. <laughs> Rose, yay, good to see you, I missed ya. Awesome, welcome. <clears throat> that sounds cool, I said. I'd love to learn more about that. It's up to you what you learn. I will show it to you if you'd like. Okay with me. Good, feel, number four, what else? I paused, trying to think of more elements to add to our list. Michael allowed me to take my time. Just before I reached the limit of my frustration, he spoke. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? He whispered. What? Can you hear me? He yelled. Yes, I can. Oh, I get it. Dynamics. That's the next element, right? Works for me. Five to go. How about rhythm? Rhythm is perfect. It is an elusive element. It also lets us know that the elements are related to each other. That was the first one I thought of. Rhythm. How so, I asked. Rhythm can, rhythm can be looked at as harmony slowed down. What do you mean? He totally lost me with that comment. A 440, A440 means that a note vibrates 440 times per second, right? Yeah, I understand that. If you keep cutting that number in half, 440, 220, 110, 55, etc., you will eventually get beats per minute. And, and at, at that point, 
It's called rhythm, you see? I do, man, that's cool. I've never heard anyone talk about that before. And the best part is, I think I actually understand it. Thinking is good enough for now, he said. If we want to, we can combine rhythm with tempo. They are different elements, but for our sake, let's put them together. Cool with you? Cool with me. All right, that's number six. What else? I sat there for a full minute trying to come up with something else I could add. Oh, excuse me. I was still trying to digest what had already been said. And it was getting harder and harder to come up with more elements. I knew they were there, but thinking of them was difficult. It shouldn't be this hard, I thought. My struggle, my struggle made me realize that when I play, my thinking is quite limited. Can you hear me now? Michael asked in a high, thin voice. Oh. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Michael asked in a high, thin voice. Yes, I answered, trying to figure out what he was getting at. How about now? <laughs> this time he used a low, bassy voice. I knew he wasn't trying to demonstrate pitch because that would be in the first category called notes. Then it hit me. Tone, I yelled. Michael chuckled. You're slow, but you do get there eventually. Tone, number seven. Very good. Next. How about phrasing? I asked almost immediately. Phrasing is a good one, he answered. Most people only think of phrasing as pertaining to, to notes, but any of the elements can be phrased. We will look at this again later. He was right. I'd never thought of phrasing anything but notes. But how can you phrase tone or dynamics? The concept intrigued me. Michael interrupted my thoughts. Two more to go. He sat there struggling for another couple of, or I sat there struggling for another couple of minutes before he finally broke the silent. Silence. The final frontier. What? Star Trek. William Shatner. The final frontier. Oh, space. I finally got it. Right. Space, rest, not playing. Very important. This is the under, underused but all-important element. Think about it. If there were no rest, all music that was ever played would still be playing. <laughs> the thought of there being no rest was disturbing. Right about then, I was really appreciating the existence of that element. One more to go, Michael Staden stated. Once again, I sat in silence, thinking, until Michael helped me out. What are you doing when I'm talking? What? Oh, listening. I get it. The final element, I answered. Very good. Now, we have ten different but equal parts of music. Notes, articulation, technique, feel, dynamics, rhythm, tone, phrasing, space, and listening. We could have made our list 100 or 1,000 elements long, but for now, we will stick with these 10. Is that okay with you? They work for me. Good. Think about all 10 of these elements and tell me this. <clears throat> when most teachers talk about music theory, which element are they usually talking about? I thought for a few seconds. Well, notes, I guess. Good. What else? I tried, but couldn't think of anything else. Notes, I repeated. That's right, he laughed. Notes, pitches, and that's it. All the fuss about learning music theory, and now we see that most teachers only teach you how to use one-tenth of the elements on our list. Their music theory only teaches you how to use notes, and it's only a theory. That's it. Nothing else. Ha 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 ha! Theories! It doesn't teach you about dynamics, feel, tone, or anything else on the list. Only notes. It should be called note theory, not music theory, because it doesn't teach you music. You can't speak music with notes alone. But you can speak music without notes at all. I can program a computer to play notes, and it wouldn't sound like music. You need these other elements to make it complete. Without them, notes are lifeless. Music theory is shallow, incomplete. It does not deserve all the attention it gets. But at the same time, notes are important. Whew! That was the first time I'd heard him speak with such force. He sounded like he really had a point to prove. I didn't quite know what to say. I didn't even know if what, I, if what he said was true. Michael was silently looking at the ground, 
so I decided to speak up. I think I understand your views on notes, so I will help. Oh, wait. so will you help me understand more about the other elements? I asked. Yes, I will look at all the elements. Yes, we will look at all of the elements individually. We've started already, but let's not leave the subject of notes just yet. Let's dive in deeper. You ready? Ready. Here we go. I didn't know what I was getting myself into. For some reason, I agreed to let this man show me about music. And although he had some interesting ideas, I didn't know if he really knew anything about it at all. Had he studied somewhere or was he making it up as he went along? I sat for a short while contemplating my dilemma when my thoughts were shattered by an outburst. Notes are overrated, Michael shouted, slamming his fist into, the open, into his open palm. Overrated, I asked. I get the sense that you have more to say about the subject. A lot more, as it turned out. Most musicians think that music is made up of notes. They forget that notes are just a part of music, and a small part at that. If you stop playing them, music would still exist. Think about that. The reason many musicians get frustrated when they start to play, especially when they start to solo, is that they rely mostly on notes to express themselves. There are only 12 notes. Imagine trying to speak a whole language using only 12 words. You see, for musicians, bass players especially, groove should be most important, but groove is not found in notes. It is found in the other nine elements. The other elements put together define the essence of groove. That is why when musicians try to play by 12 notes alone, they quickly run out of things to say. I knew what he was talking about, and I was definitely guilty of it. Most of my musical study had been dedicated to notes, which is why I usually had a hard time playing well. Everything I knew about groove, I'd learned on my own. No teacher or book ever really told me what it was. When I thought about it, I realized Michael was showing me that groove, for the most part, doesn't get equal attention. I've seen many books teaching notes, but I've yet to see a book on rest, articulation, or tone. I realized that most of the other elements we listed were, were rarely, rarely taught. Most musicians had to learn them on their own. This was starting to get interesting. I was getting a glimpse into the vastness of music, which made me wonder why most teachers choose to confine it to 12 notes. I hoped Michael could shed more light on the subject. <clears throat> Many musicians, he said, are afraid of those 12 notes. If they hit the wrong one, they get scared and quickly leave that note in search of the right one. Right one. That's what you were doing when you were trying to find the key. If you make friends with whichever note you happen to land on, it will give you directions to where you are trying to go. Most inexperienced bass players have to find the root before they can play anything else. That is a very elementary way of thinking. When I asked you to play earlier, you didn't listen to you didn't listen to what you played. You only listened for the root. And when you didn't hit on it, or when you didn't hit it on your first try, you jumped around blindly until you found it. Now listen, he instructed as he walked over to my cheap electronic keyboard. There are how many notes in Western music? Twelve, I answered. How many notes are there in most of the key signatures we play in? Seven. Correct. In any key, there are seven so-called right notes, which leave only five so-called wrong notes. What this means is even if we don't know what key we are in and guess which note to play, we will be right more than half the time. Look, he continued, pointing at the keyboard. In the key of C major, the rule book... <clears throat> Excuse me, one second. Oh, I think I finally got that out. Woohoo! Look, he continued, pointing to the at the keyboard. In the key of C major, the rule book states that you're allowed to play the white keys only. But what would happen if you accidentally landed on a black key? Nothing, because if you took on either side of this wrong note, what do you see? A right note, I answered proudly. Absolutely. 
You are never more than a half step away from a right note. Never. So what are you afraid of? You can't be lost. If you land on a wrong note, just step off of it and either just step off of it in either direction and you are right again. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Even if I close my eyes and throw a dart at a keyboard, it will hit a right note more than half the time. Was blind, but now I see. This way of looking at notes caused me to see them in a new way. If I was never more than a half step away from a right note, like Michael had said, my world would be much easier. That was a relief. Michael read my thoughts, perhaps literally. This is liberating, is it not? He remarked. The real beauty is this. If you use your ears and listen to that accidental note, you may find that it actually sounds better than the right note you intended to play. He walked back over to the guitar and started playing a simple groove. He looked at me, talking while he played. Don't be afraid of the notes. Jump right in. All I want you to do is listen to whether the note is in the key or not. Just think in or out. If the note is in, listen to it and realize where you are in relationship to the root. If the note is out, slide your finger one fret in either direction and voila, you are right again. I picked up my bass and without thinking, played the first note my finger landed on. It sounded horrible, so I quickly slid my finger down one fret. Michael was correct. I was now on a right note and it sounded good. I wanted to test this theory, so I played the same wrong note again, but this time I slid my finger up one fret. Like before, I was on a right note. It made me smile. I also noticed something else. I wasn't sure as yet that it was really happening, so I repeated the process a few more times. I then found a different wrong note to start on and repeated the whole process. What I noticed shocked me. I started to tell him what I discovered. Seeing the expression on my face, he spoke first. Go ahead, tell me. It was difficult to explain, but I gave it a try. I noticed that when I went from the wrong notes to the right notes over and over again, it made the wrong notes gradually sound right. The more I did it, the writer, the wrong notes started to sound until they didn't sound wrong at all anymore. Why? He asked me. Why didn't those notes sound wrong anymore? Maybe it's because the wrong notes are leading somewhere, are leading somewhere. Repeating the wrong note allows the listener to know where it's going so that it begins to sound right. I confused myself. It surprised me that Michael understood what I had just said. Very nice. He was smiling now. I call this massaging the notes. It's a great way to correct mistakes after they've already been made. I like to think of it as a way to change the past. Wow. I like that, I said. I've got a million of them, he responded in a comedic voice. <laughs> you can also play the right notes so much that they start to sound wrong. Overusing a note can sound just as bad as playing a, a wrong note. Basically, every note has something to say. They all lead somewhere if you just listen to them. How do you use them as the key? No, wait. how you use them is the key. As I said before, the notes will tell you where they want to go. You just have to listen. I know that I didn't listen that way, I commented. I noticed, he replied. Many musicians study so much music theory that they only remember how to tell the notes where to go. They have learned to forget that notes are alive. I urge you to listen to the notes. They may have something to tell you. I'd never thought about listening to notes that way to see what they had to tell me. I'd always tried to tell the notes where to go, and most of the time, they seemed to resist. Let me hold your bass, he instructed. Michael took my bass and handed me the guitar. He asked me to play the same chords he'd been playing. Before I had to ask, he let me off the hook by telling me what they were, G minor to G7. The guitar didn't sound the same in my hands as it did in his, but I did my best. He asked if I could play and listen at the same time. I said that I could. Michael started from the highest note on my bass and moved down one fret at a time, playing every note on the instrument. 
He then did the same thing in reverse, starting from the lowest note and ending at the highest. It was simple, but against the chords I was playing, it sounded amazing. Yeah, Rose. Yes, yes. I'd never heard that before. I'd also never heard my bass sound that good. My old Univox, which I'd always thought of as a beat up, as I've always, <clears throat> which I'd always thought of as beat up, suddenly came to life. And all he'd done was play a chromatic scale. I knew that many of the notes he played were not in the key signature and shouldn't have sounded that good, but somehow he made them all work. I was astounded at what I was hearing. Which of these notes sounded bad? He asked with a confident smile. None of them did, I replied, still in shock. Why? Because you were playing them and not me. The first truthful thing you've said all day. You graduate. Class over. <laughs> no, really. I don't know why all the notes sounded good. I guess it was how you played them and made them work. Right again. Now, how did I play them? I don't know. I guess you... I couldn't think of an appropriate answer at first, and then it hit me. I had the answer, and I knew it. It was so simple that I was surprised that I'd never thought of it before that day. I didn't even feel proud of myself for coming up with the answer because I should have known it immediately. You didn't just rely on the notes alone. You added in more of the other elements of music. I knew that I was right, so I answered with my own smile of complete confidence. Progress, I heard him whisper, almost to himself. We are making progress. For the next few hours, we played music together, together, often switching between bass and guitar. What he showed me was remarkably simple. Every once in a while, he would use the keyboard to demonstrate something else about notes. His proficiency on that instrument was just as stunning as it was on the guitar and the bass. The only thing that surprised me more was the fact that, until that day, I didn't know that the keyboard still worked. Until that day, I wasn't sure if my brain still worked either, but I was starting to get it. I was actually understanding what the crazy man was showing me. We massaged notes, listened to notes, directed notes, and just played notes until I was familiar and comfortable with all of them. He had me spend time with the chromatic scale, one note at a time, listening to what each note had to say about the key we were in. Then he would change keys and have me repeat the whole process. Each note would say something different as the chord changed. That exercise was a revelation to me. Another exercise involved playing notes randomly without thinking of what I was going to play first. Just play any note, he instructed. Jump all over the bass if you don't care. I was surprised at how hard it was to do. I had a difficult time not playing patterns. My fingers kept landing on top of the frets instead of in between instead of in between them mistakes he told me are just things we didn't mean to play it doesn't mean they are wrong some of the best music i've ever played started out as a mistake mistakes usually throw us off because the note comes out before we think about it we can't avoid making mistakes but we can get comfortable with them especially if we practice making them that's deep the thought of our practicing mistakes was another strange but interesting idea. I had no idea how I was supposed to practice that. Michael answered my thought. This random exercise stimulates making mistakes so that they no longer affect us negatively. If we learn to play random notes cleanly, playing any pre-thought note or pattern will be a piece of cake. I was learning things I'd never learned before, and it was exciting. My mind was open to receive... My mind was open and receptive to everything he had to say. Well, almost everything. It was exactly what I needed. Play like a child with an air guitar, Michael advised. A child playing air guitar never plays a wrong note. For the first time in a long time, I played like a child. I loved it. <laughs> and that was measure two. And that is where I'm going to call it today. Dudes. Thank you, Victor. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, everyone here. 
Dang, juicy. Oh my gosh, I love it. Oh my gosh, I hope Corey listens to this. So, I love yous. And I know I'll be back sooner than later. It's likely I'll be here tomorrow, but we'll do it like we feel it, like we always do. So thank you very much. And I wish you wonderful the rest of your evenings or whenever you find this. And uh, thank you again. Mwah. I love you. Trace B, I love you. Oh my gosh. Okay, wait, all right. Wait, now I got to tell a really cool story real quick. Um, a couple of days ago, I got home and uh, we had given my parents a kitten for their anniversary. This cute little kitten is so cute. And um, when I got home, the music playing on my radio was Black Velvet. And um, <clears throat> I hadn't heard it in such a long time. Well, when I got upstairs and I got myself all um, like into what I was doing, I pulled out my phone and I had a message from Trace and um, she'd sent me a link. And I knew, I knew when I, when I went to hit the link that it was going to be black velvet and it was, <laughs> it was, it was black velvet. And then I listened to it again, which was great because I didn't even finish it out when I was in my vehicle. And, um, Mississippi in the middle of a dress bell. Jimmy Rogers on the Victoria High. Dude, dude, what a jam. Anyways, thank you so much, Trace. What a magical sync that was. I mean, honestly, I love you too. And all the pictures and baby Oliver. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Okay. So I will see you guys probably tomorrow. Thank you so much. Mwah. I love you.